Well, for the next three weeks, we're going to be taking a break from our usual routine of preaching through a book of the Bible. We've obviously finished 1 Peter. It was a nine-week series. We're going to now go to three standalone selected passages of, of scriptures from the gospel. And here's why. The desire behind that is to celebrate with complete focus the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, whilst every Sunday ought to be a resurrection Sunday, a celebration of the gospel, and that's what we strive to do here, this Paschal month, you know, this build up to resurrection Sunday, where Christ became our Passover lamb, where he suffered and he bled and he died, and then he rose again to save a world that was in sin and error, repining and lost. That should be brought with full attention to our world this time of year. Uh, before us now, church, really, for the next few weeks, is a real opportunity for mission um, where we can bring our unsaved friends, perhaps our unsaved loved ones, to church so that they can hear this news which first rippled across Jerusalem one glorious Easter morning, the news that Jesus Christ, who claimed to be the Son of God, who claimed to be the Savior of the world, who claimed that He would die for our sins and then rise from the dead to prove He was everything he ever said he was, well, this very Jesus has in fact risen from the dead and he's changed the world forevermore as a result. A result. So we draw the world's attention to this reality. We ask, have you heard? Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Have you considered the veracity of this claim? Have you considered the evidence for this reality? Have you considered what this means for your life and for all of life for that matter? It is the most important theological truth of the Christian church. It really is. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain and your faith is in vain. That means it's an empty thing. It's an ineffective thing, particularly in what it claims to do, which is give us everlasting life and forgive us of our sins. But he continues in verses 20 to 21 gloriously. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead that he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That as by a man death came, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ, our new federal head, all shall be made alive. What a hope this morning. And as we look to the turning of spring, you know, in the coming weeks, it's not here quite yet, but as we look to the reality of new life bursting across our city, in the coming weeks, in all its vibrance and vigor. Well, may the church celebrate all the more the reality that Christ burst forth from the tomb. He emerged victoriously from the grave. And because of that, our hope springs eternal. Our hope is Christ. And we do not apologize once again this morning for saying, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. It's the greatest hope and salvation that we could ever know and have. And this morning we turn to Mark's gospel, and it seems to me Mark's gospel is a very fitting starting point for this series. And here's why, you know, people have asked me this week, why particularly Mark? Well, Mark draws our attention to something that the other gospels pay less attention to. Each, each of the four gospels do that. They, they come at Jesus from a different angle to tell a fuller story of who he is. That's what the synoptic gospels mean. It means to see together. So it's actually through the four separate accounts with these different sets of focuses and details that we see a full testimony of who Jesus is. And one of the areas of focus for Mark is that there were three groups of people mentioned with frequency throughout his gospel, none of whom really understood who Jesus really was until after he died and rose from the dead. It wasn't until afterwards. So you have this first group, which might shock you, the disciples who on the night Jesus was arrested, what did they do? They fled. They abandoned the Lord in terror and confusion. Some of them even denied they ever knew him. Then you have the second group of people, the religious leaders. You know, all throughout Jesus' ministry, the religious leaders, they were at loggerheads with Jesus. Uh, they, they were the ones that were responsible for knowing the Word of God, knowing all these hundreds of Old Testament prophecies, and seeing Jesus' signs and saying, this is the Messiah. That's who this is. But instead, they called him a devil. Instead, they sought 
to have him arrested and murdered. And then you have the third group, the crowds. You know, oh, how they followed Jesus when he gave them bread and fish. Oh, how they followed Jesus whenever he could heal them. But these crowds were then mentioned as the very group of people at the foot of the cross mocking Jesus as he hung on the cross for their sins. So the disciples abandoned Jesus. The religious leaders, they arrested and murdered him. And the crowds mocked him. They didn't know who he truly was until after he died. It was afterwards. Well, in our, think about it. In our modern day and age, you know, history has a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? For many today, they just simply don't grasp the centrality, the magnitude of Jesus Christ for all of life and what he really means to their lives. You know, many today perhaps have no idea why Jesus is even relevant to their lives. Why would he be? Is maybe the question they would ask. And so Mark's gospel in our context is a very good starting point to tell an unfamiliar world that Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, is the most important person in your life in every single waking hour that you have. And so look with me to our immediate context at Mark 14. And you'll see the context here in verse 32. It says that Jesus has come with his followers to a place called Gethsemane. And he says to most of his disciples to stay at the front entrance of this garden, which was actually an olive orchard on the side of the, the Mount of Olives. Now, just prior to this in chapter 14, Jesus had shared a meal with his followers in the upper room in Jerusalem. And Jesus told them, he said, tonight was the night that he would be betrayed. He says that if you see in verse 27, if you have a Bible with you, he says, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He said that to them over the meal. And naturally, the disciples, they were just so alarmed at what was going on. They didn't even fully understand that Jesus was going to die for their sins. They had an entirely different idea of what the Messiah would be like. But Jesus prepared them for the sleepless and terrifying night ahead that they would face. In the other gospels, he says, you sorrow now, but joy will come. You sorrow now for a little while. Jesus knew what he was doing. So we enter into a very dark and unsettling time for the disciples in this context. Uh, and if we think it was a difficult time for them, who did not fully understand what Jesus must do, well, today we're going to see that it was infinitely more difficult for the Lord Jesus to endure what was now beginning to occur. Because Jesus was finally entering into what he called throughout the Gospels his hour his time of suffering and death for the payment, or sorry, in payment for the sins of the world. And I want us to see this whole event from Jesus' perspective. Look first at our first point here. At verses 33 to 35 show us the agony of Jesus. We read here, and he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it was possible, the hour might pass from him. Now you might read those words, and like the disciples, you might be completely confused as to what exactly is happening here. It's painfully obvious that Jesus is experiencing the most severe mental anguish. But in actual fact, the reality of what was occurring here was far more terrible it really was. You see, the agony of Jesus from this moment uh, that, that, uh, on, the agony of Jesus from this moment on was that Jesus was becoming a curse for us. He was actually becoming a curse for us. He was only just beginning to experience what we as believers were supposed to experience outside of saving faith in Christ. What does Paul say in Galatians 3.13? He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Now granted, I accept this is fully realized on the cross. Because as Jesus hung up on the cross, it was there that Jesus became sin. He became the one who stood in our place. And it was there that God poured out his righteous wrath and his righteous anger 
fully upon the Son for the sins of the world. But the beginning of Christ's passion and suffering, make no mistake, begins right here with him experiencing in his human form what it meant to be accursed, to stand in the stead of ruined sinners, taking upon himself sin so that he could save us from the wrath of the Father. Look what our salvation cost Jesus. It says here in verse 33, Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. I would say that's putting it mildly when you look at the Greek words. Ekthambeo is the word for greatly distressed. And it means that Jesus was astonished in horror at what lay ahead. And troubled here, the next word in verse 33, it means he was distressed over knowing what was about to happen. You see, he knew it would be only hours away where Judas would come back with those who would arrest him. He would be tried falsely in a proxy court. He would be sentenced to death. And he'd be given the most painful form of death penalty that the Roman Empire could think of at the time, which was crucifixion. So verse 33 gives us a glimpse into Jesus' mental agony, his mental anguish long before Jesus' physical suffering on the cross. Jesus' psychological agony had already begun. And and Mark, the gospel writer, you know, bravely, he lets us see just how bad it was with the use of that word ekthambeo, conveying the greatest sense of horror and dread Jesus was experiencing as he became a curse for us, as he began to stand in our place. But Jesus' experience, uh, you know, of, of spiritual agony is then conveyed to us. It's here as well in the text. Even greater was Jesus' spiritual agony. We've already seen the psychological agony. Look at the spiritual agony. Look at what Jesus says to his disciples in verse 34. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. You know, it was Matthew Henry, great 17th century theologian. And he said of this text, he said, Christ's sufferings began with the source of all, those in his soul. You know, Christ began experiencing in the garden what it meant, church, what it meant, believer, to be the object of God, the Father's righteous wrath and punishment. He was going through the horror of being that curse on our behalf, of becoming abandoned, And cut off in his human nature, not in his divine nature. In his human nature. You know, there's a well-known Irish hymn writer, a hymn written by Stuart Tynan. And you will know it well, how deep the Father's love for us. Well, there's, there's, there's them opening verses we sing, how great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring money sons to glory. And, you know, whenever we look at what our precious Lord actually went through, you know, with heavy hearts and a sense of our own unworthiness and guilt, you know, a stomach-churning sense of regret makes us see that what Jesus went through was so much more intense, really, than God turning his face away. That's what the song says. And I know what Stuart was trying to say. He was trying to communicate the sense of abandonment Christ experienced, the cutting off, which is precisely what a condemned and unbelieving sinner will experience whenever they, they die outside of saving faith in Christ. And in that sense, Stuart's very helpful. The song's very helpful. But if anything, church, God the Father didn't turn his face away. If anything, God the Father looked upon his son feeling the same sense of pain and agony that Jesus was feeling, knowing that it was the only way that this was necessary and that only Jesus could save a world of ruined sinners. And God the Father, he didn't leave the room when Jesus began his hour of suffering. He didn't turn to the angels, you know, to the seraphim and the cherubim and say, call me when it's done. I can't look at this. No, God the Father, he knew it was necessary to be the one who would preside over Jesus' punishment. He had to be the one to do it, the righteous judge. And so he looked upon the son whom he loved, whom he adored, and in the words of Matthew Henry, he set his terrors against him. 
the terrors that condemned sinners would face, and he allowed Jesus the Son to contemplate them. He allowed them to, allowed him to. And it made Jesus sorrowful. Even to death, you know, he was crushed by this distress. Have you ever been so low in your life that you feel your body just won't keep going? You, won't, you can't sustain this level of depression and loneliness of a state. Jesus was being crushed by this distress. The sins of the whole world, like dark storm clouds gathering on the horizon, were beginning to ascend over the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. Your church, we have only cause to be at peace because Isaiah the prophet said, the punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. How could we ever look at Christ with a sense, without a sense of awe, at what he did for us? As, as we read these words, we're, we're reading the experience which, which was on Jesus so that we would be spared from taking it upon ourselves. We're reading about the horror we would have faced outside of saving faith in Jesus. We're reading a horror story that we would have been the main characters in had it not been for God's great love for us. I don't know if you've heard the last words of unbelievers as they know they're about to die. I hope you don't ever have to hear them. I hope if there are any unbelievers with us this morning that you would see the beauty of Christ and your need for him and his willingness to meet you in that need through faith in him, through the finished work of the cross and the empty tomb. You know, I pray you allow him to take the experience of being accursed, abandoned and eternally condemned from you by heeding this call to repent and believe in him. It was Sir Thomas Scott, he was Chancellor of England, during the English Reformations, totally against the English reformers, a very famed atheist. And he took suddenly ill on, the, on December 1594. And before he died, he said these words, until this moment I never thought, or until this moment I thought there was neither a God nor a hell. Now I know and feel that there are both, and I am doomed. Sir Thomas Paine, leading atheist thinker of the American colonies, he wrote The Age of Reason, basically a manifesto against God, a wildly popular book in the colonies. And as he lay dying, he said, Stay with me for God's sake. I cannot bear to be left alone. O oh Lord, help me. O oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? I would give worlds if I had them that the age of reason had never been published. Oh, Lord, help me. Christ, help me. No, don't leave. Stay with me. Send even a child to stay with me, for I am on the edge of hell here alone. I know probably the most distressing last words that I had ever read in any form of literature uh, from an atheist was the words of David Hume. Again, just a leading atheist and philosopher of his time. Well, just before David Hume died, he cried out to the room, I am in flames. Apparently, it was a, just a horrific scene. And we wonder why the Lord Jesus preached so much on hell. Was it to bash people? Oh, it was out of love. It was out of knowing what hell was. That's why Jesus came to spare us from such a fate, from such a, such a fate that C.S. Lewis says, the unrepentant sinner goes into eternity and God essentially says, all right, have it your way because I made a way for you. I've made a way for you. I know my intention here is not to speak ill of the dead. Oh, I'm so horrified and, and sorry that those men are presently cut off from God. I'm so horrified by it. But my hope is that people will wake from their stupor, that people will see their desperate need for Christ. And I hope that people will see here in the text that Jesus stood in the stead of ruined sinners. And he endured the agony of becoming a curse for us. He endured the horrors 
of the sinner. The Father allowed him to contemplate them, to bear them on the cross. And through that, we see how great his suffering was for us. How could we ever mock it? How could we ever sit indifferent to it? How could the unbeliever not run to Christ this day and flee from certain horror? How could the believer not look at the cross and feel the heaviness of it and humbly rejoice, saying, that you, thank you, Lord, for taking my sin so that I could ever walk free? What freedom we have this morning, church. You know, verse 35 really hits home. Going a little farther, Jesus fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. You know, usually in those times, one would pray standing up. Um, Jesus did it before, standing up, arms outstretched to heaven and addressing God. But if you were in grief and great distress or lamenting, you would lay prostrates, face down, just as Jesus did here. And he was lamenting. He was crying out loud. So the main observation in verses 33 to 35 is that Jesus was in psychological and spiritual agony in the garden because he, became a, he was becoming a curse for us, as Galatians 3.13 says. He was taking upon us himself what we deserved. But now look at the hero Jesus truly is. Look at our Savior shine through this darkest, his darkest hour and look at the obedience of Jesus in verses 36 to 40. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Now let's first deal with verses 37 down to 40. Let's not go to that, that first verse in verse 36, what I will, but you will yet. Let's just go to verses 37 to 40, because Mark, John Mark, the gospel writer, he's very honest and forthcoming, it has to be said, in how he paints the disciples. There's only one hero in humanity's story, and that is Jesus. The apostles, arguably the most famous of the apostles, Peter, James, and John, were totally unaware of what Jesus was really going through. Clearly, they were. Maybe they were sleepy after the meal they had earlier. Most likely, they were just tired from walking all day, and it was late. But regardless, you know, Jesus comes, and he finds them sleeping in verse 37, and he bids them anew to keep watch. He says, the spirit is willing, but indeed the flesh is weak. But Jesus leaves a second time to pray, and then he returns in verse 39. Mark this time includes these words. For their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And again, yes, I know this is likely due to physical exhaustion. But what we can't ignore is the very obvious parallels here. The, the, the very obvious spiritual undertone which John and his gospel really picks up on better. But isn't there a physical drowsiness to Christ so representative of where they were in their spiritual understanding of the Lord? They were drowsy. Aren't we tempted at many times in our Christian walk to become sleepy and drowsy to the realities of the gospel and who Jesus Christ is and the freedom we have in him? Well, there's so much undertones here and parallels to their to where their, their spiritual understanding of Christ came. And it's so representative. They didn't fully see. They didn't grasp the importance of this crucial moment. You know, Christ was so alone in what he was going through. The disciples were drowsy. They were disconnect. So Christ's closest followers and friends, they were sleeping and he could have benefited from their company at this point the most if ever Jesus needed company, it was now. You know, put yourself in that place. Just imagine what our Lord went through. I was sitting in my study this week thinking, you know, it was springtime. It was during the Paschal full moon. So the Garden of Gethsemane, it, it would have been eliminated by that shadowy blue beneath the full moon. I'm sure you've seen that late at night before on a spring night. There's, it just would have been this shadowy blue place the temperature can drop down at about 
12 degrees Celsius at that time. If you're used to much hotter temperatures, that could be very uncomfortable. Maybe it was colder this time of the year. But the Greek words for Jesus' psychological and spiritual anguish, they just paint this picture of him walking through the garden in in that shadowy blue place in heart-pounding anguish. And he did it all for us. You know, the first stories I ever truly loved was the Lord of the Rings. They, they, they set me off in my love for all kinds of literature. And I remember reading a quote one day by a theologian, and he said, you know, literature's greatest heroes, history's greatest heroes, they're mere shadows of the true hero, Jesus Christ. And I thought, that's right. That is so true. That is on the money. And whenever I see when our Lord went through in the garden, walking by himself, Praying to God, as the text says here, but notice the text doesn't record an answer. Jesus was cut off, humanly speaking, in that place. The angels who sang his praises in heaven, who presided over the manger, who sang to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men, for to you in this day in the city of David is born a Savior. Those angels were not singing to Christ in the garden. They didn't minister to him as they did in the desert. They distanced themselves. It was necessary. They watched as the chosen one would die for sinners, as the perfect would see of the ruined. This punishment was the cup of God's wrath on ruined sinners, and Jesus had to drink every drop if the mission of the gospel was to truly see of sinners in this ruined world. And what amazes me about Jesus is, unlike those great heroes of history and literature, Aragorn, Frodo, whoever you want to call up to the table here, Jesus had a choice. God was already pleased with him. Jesus didn't need to go to the cross if he didn't want to, but Jesus wanted to. You look at all the the heroes of literature, they had no choice but to fight against the darkness and evil because it was going to take all that they loved, Jesus had a choice. And the Godhead clearly wanted to save undeserving humanity from the disease of their sin. And so Jesus became obedient. And he drank every last drop of the cup of God's wrath. And he concludes in verse 36. So we're going back now. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. You know, I think this was one of Jesus' finest moments, and there are many, aren't there? But Jesus could have said no. He could have said, take me away, it's too much. And God the Father would have opened heaven, and a chariot of angels would have taken Christ away. That was Jesus' chance. But he didn't. He saw the pain ahead. And he became obedient, as Philippians 2, verse 8 says. He became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross for us. Do we understand this this morning? For us. Oh, what we owe to the Savior. We owe him our lives. We owe him our faith, our repentance, our allegiance. The source of our satisfaction and joy should be found in him because he took the cup that was reserved for us. Wasn't it Andrew Bonar who once wrote those powerful words, death and the curse were in our cup. Oh, Christ, t'was full for thee. But thou hast drained the last dark drop. Tis empty now for me. What a relief. What a joy. You know, around this time of year, we rightly celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead. And that is right and good and wonderful. But with our three-week series, I want us to walk the way of suffering with Jesus. And just see him. See him saving us. See him in his bravery, in his love, in his devotion, in his unwavering obedience to follow through and save sinners like us. He was going to die for those who were by nature his enemy, who were by nature cut off so that they could be rejoined with God, so that the orphan could have a father in God again, that we would be able to sit at the table of the Lord as his children once again, and it took nothing less than Jesus obediently enduring the cup of God's wrath 
poured out on him on our behalf. Jesus was fully aware of what it would cost him. But you know what? Jesus was fully aware as well of what his sacrifice would achieve. And so as we have saw the agony of Jesus and the obedience of Jesus, even now we get a glimpse of Jesus' glory in these final verses in 41 to 42. Let's look at the glory of Jesus. Jesus has resolved to go through with his plan of salvation. And now look at the determination for him to face the kingdom of darkness, to face the penalty of our sin, to take upon himself the wrath of God in order to save us in verses 41 to 42. He comes back a third time and a final time and he says, are you still sleeping, taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. These events have been set in motion. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Look at the resolve. Look at the bravery of our King and the determination of the Lord. Jesus hasn't found hiding. He gathers his followers and he goes to meet his destiny head on. It's like that quote from Alexander Dumas that we quoted last week from the Count of Monte Cristo. It's like Jesus is going and saying, death, do your worst for I will do mine. What a king we have in Jesus. You know, finally, after 32 years away from heaven, after three years of nonstop public ministry, the moment of all time in history that I've been building up to had arrived. Jesus was going to be tried and crucified for the sins of the world. But Jesus was obedient in all of this because there was something driving him on. It was the knowledge that his sacrifice would result in our eternal joy and his eternal glory. We see the glory of Jesus here, but it's only a glimpse of what, what his finished work on the cross would consummate for all eternity in the kingdom of heaven and on a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. Because one day we will all gather in those who have believed to a kingdom and we will fall prostrate before the risen and victorious king and we will celebrate him for millions and millions and millions of years and for all eternity, church. We will see, as Christ did, a world without sin. We will live in a reality where our hope springs eternal. We will dwell in Christ's presence knowing that our eternal joy was procured by his sacrifice in our place, and we will worship him unreservedly in our immortal bodies forever. How do I know this? If this is the first time you're hearing this, how do I know this? Because the same Christ who had rose from the dead gave us this scene in Revelation 7, one of my favorite scenes in all of Scripture. He showed us what the author of the Hebrews meant in Hebrews 12 too, by saying, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. And it was this future joy, this picture in Revelation 7, let me read what the Apostle John recorded. He said, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worship God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Oh, church, today in these 10 verses, we have seen the price of our redemption. We'll have to leave it there, but it's just a taste for what we're going to see over these next few weeks. And so in summary, may we worship Christ for enduring the agony of becoming a curse for us, for becoming obedient unto death, and for the glory of his resurrected name. Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team forward to lead us before and close our meeting in prayer.